And good evening and welcome back to Beyond the Trailer Park. Good to have everybody back with us again this week. And Beth and I are really excited because this week we are introducing our own nuclear weapon, Ms. Callie Wright of the Gayest <laughs> <Hi>. Manifesto. <laughs> Hello, Ms. Callie. <laughs> Hi, how are you? We are good, we are good. So Callie comes from, to us, and she is a new podcaster with a show called The Gaytheist Manifesto on Secular Media with a couple of her friends also as co-hosts. So that's pretty exciting to have a new show. You've got, what, two episodes out, right? Yes, episode two just went up last week. Yes, and it's very cool, I have to say. It's very enjoyable. Thank you. Yes, and even... More exciting is Callie is finding herself in life. Callie is transgender and she is finally being able to be who she is and live an authentic life and we're really excited for her. Thank you. Yay. You're welcome. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to uh, talk a little bit about you and your journey and what all that's been like for you so far. And then later, uh, I want to talk about just the whole um, issue of, of transgender and how folks like myself, who really don't know any transgender people, um, you know, how to be a good ally, how to be a good support, and how to um, just, you know, be a good citizen with transgender folk. So tell us about yourself, Kelly. Well, I, um, I've been out publicly for about two years now, mm -hmm. um, f uh, presenting and living full-time as myself for almost that long. Um, I, when I was about 10, I was in fifth grade, whatever age you are when you're in fifth grade, um, and uh, that's about the time that puberty starts. So... Mm -hmm. Kids always freak out about puberty because puberty's weird and puberty's awkward for everyone. Um, but it was it was different for me. Um, my body just was it, it wasn't lining up with the way that I thought it should be. And mm -hmm. you know that's also about the age where you start to notice like the real real differences between boys and yes. girls. And um, I just I kind of had. I don't know if I would call it an epiphany because I don't know exactly if, if I knew really what the implications of this were when I said right. it to myself, but I actually like turned my head and mouthed the words to myself. Like I turned my head so no one could see it and I mouthed the words to myself. I was supposed to be a girl. And, yeah. um, and that was just, it was a really freaky realization because I didn't know that, you know, that was a thing. Like, I thought that there was something wrong with me, like I was, you know, sick in the head or uh, just confused. Uh, well, I mean, I was confused, um, but you know, I didn't know that, you know, this was this was something that that is a real thing, and um, you know, so I hid it. Uh, I didn't I didn't tell anybody. I didn't, you know, aside from you know sneaking into my mom's closet when I was a kid, like. I never really acted on any of it. I never told anybody how I felt. Um, and then you just did your best to fit in with what you were perceived. You, you perceived your role was, and you were trying to fit that in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, eventually, uh, when I was about twenty-eight, two years ago, I'm thirty now. Um, you know, I, I I was really good at denial, so. You know, there were a lot of times where I could just kind of push it in the back of my head, and it wasn't something that I really thought about very much. Um, you know, and then there were times where it was kind of the only thing that I could think about, and I would, you know, kind of sit and dream about how awesome life would be like if I was able to actually undertake, um, you know, transitioning and actually being who I knew I really was. But yeah. it never seemed practical, and I worried about things like, you know, is life going to be worth living on the other side of transition? Am I going to be, wow. you know, an object of pity to people? Like, even people who love me and support me, you know, w what's that going to do for my quality of life? 
and right. all of these questions, and you know, eventually hiding it just got to be too much. So, um, you know, I started coming out to close friends and family, and just kind of saying I had a really close friend who kind of held my hand through the very beginning of the process. Uh, she told me that she'd met a trans person and uh, a social group that she was a part of. And she was like, you know, it kind of made me uncomfortable at first, but the more I got to know her, the more I realized, like, she's just she's just a person. That's not a big deal. So I kind of identified her as, as a safe person to say, hey, like, I think this is a thing. And, you know, she was like, well, what, what can I do to help you explore this? So we, um, you know, we set a date. She lives a few hours away from me. Uh, we set a date. She came. She came over. We went clothes shopping. She brought her makeup. And, um, <laughs> kind of did like a makeover and and uh, and you know, I, I walked into the bathroom to look at myself in the mirror after all this was over with. And um, there's no way to describe the feeling without sounding like Deepak Chopra. <laughs> As long as it wasn't a quantum experience. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was I, I knew it on a quantum level. Uh, um but it, it was it was really like looking in the mirror and actually seeing myself for the first time. Um, you know, throughout my whole life when I would see pictures of myself or I would look at myself in the mirror, I didn't I didn't hate myself or anything like that. I just, I just knew that that wasn't a representation of who I really was, and the person that I saw that day was, and uh, that, that was, it, it was, really profound. it was incredibly profound. It was, it was one of the most, pro if not the most profound experience I've ever had, um, and, and that was when I knew, like, yeah, this is, this is a real thing. This, this has to happen. Um, and, you know, and, and that's, there's, there's so many little things that maybe you don't necessarily think about. Like, there's obviously clothes and, yep. you know, makeup and all that sort of stuff. But there's, yeah. you know, the way that you interact with people, there's the physical changes. There's this concept of dysphoria where your brain expects your body to be a way that it's not. Right. And it's you know anxiety and stress caused by those two things not matching with one another. Right. Um, so it's it's all of these things that you're fighting against, and you know those those anxieties and those struggles have gotten less and less the more and more I've been able to embrace this as who I am. Um, like, what kind of a, a struggle was it like to? you know, sort of fit that expected role all the whole time sort of knowing that that's not who you are. Like, I can't imagine how just continuously exhausting that must be. Well, you know, sometimes it was actually kind of easy because, I, because like I said, I was really, really good at denial. <laughs> and I think at best I had myself convinced, like, well, you know, you just, like, dressing in women's clothes as, like, a fetish kind of thing. Right. And, like, I kind of convinced myself to be satisfied with that explanation for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I was in a band, and we did the tour thing. And, and I mean, that was, like, bands and music, that was kind of my life from, like, 14 until, like, 26-ish. Right. Um, so, you know, I always had that stuff going on, and... You know, it, it's you know, it's cool to be the band guy. Everybody likes the band guy, and um, you know, so I had I had a lot of stuff to cover it up with, if that makes sense. No, um, that is. That is. I, and there were times when it was really exhausting, and you know, there'd be a group of guys and a group of girls, and I really just want to go hang out with a group of girls because I identify with them more. Um, but all these guys, especially the guys in the band that I was in, they're all my best friends. Right uh, and 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 still are. I mean, the you know the band broke up like four or five years ago, and we're all still best friends. Um, so yeah, so just lots of really really awkward feelings and just lots of internal monologue. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's yeah, it's it's complicated. <laughs> but it sounds like you managed to find ways to sort of distract yourself from from the the dissonance. I guess is the way to put it. 
with you know yeah. the band. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That must have yeah. been fun on tour though. What kind of what kind of band did you have? Oh, it was a, it was a metal band. Like if you've ever heard bands like uh, like the Devil Wears Prada, or um, oh, I'm trying to think of other big ones. Um, <laughs> metal like Kill Switch Engage. <laughs> Like metalcore kind of. Yeah, yeah. Now I know why you like my other show so much. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Of metal heads over there. Well, I was more industrial goth, but still, I appreciate some good. Right. <laughs> but yeah, and, and with right. a metal band, with a metal band, you could sort of push the boundary a little bit, I imagine, and, you know, grow your hair and maybe wear some makeup and stuff like that, too. I oh, God, yeah. When when uh, guys wearing girl jeans became a thing, you have no mm-hmm. idea how happy I was when that, when that, <laughs> when that whole thing happened. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's in a way, like, you know, you think about... It worked for you. It got you through. But in a way, it's it's it shouldn't have to be that way. That you have to find these little sort of ways to to be yourself in a way that people don't know that you're being yourself. Like that's you know it just seems so wrong to me. Yeah, and and the you know the the weird thing is in my case, um, you know I I never really had a fear of being rejected by my family or by my friends. You know my fear was all about you know, my my sort of place in society, like, you know, my job and right. interacting with people in public and stuff like that. Um, I, I never really had doubts about my friends or family support. And, it, and you know, I still wasn't able to, to come to terms with that just because of, you know, all the messages we grow up with surrounding, you know, what, you know, what a man is supposed to be, what a woman is supposed to be. Yeah. And, you know, those lines are fixed and you don't cross those lines no matter what. Yeah. And it it's does it even for me like you know I don't have any any of those challenges but even I I'm a very girly girl but I don't cook hell right <laughs> I don't I don't do like housework I hate housework and the big one I've never ever wanted to be a mother mm-hmm. never and a lot of people are like but you're a woman you're supposed to want to no. <laughs> Like, you know, that that's great if people do, but I don't fit that role, and I'm not going to to try and make myself fit that role just because everyone else does. So I can, that's just like a small part of me, and I just, it, it, I can only imagine how, you know, if I had to spend my whole life not being me, like, to the, for, to the maximum, I just, you know, it, it takes a lot of, um, strength of character, I think, to to make it through all of that. So kudos well, thank to you. That. And I, well, I love. And, the- and it's interesting how that how that that plays into the other side of it too, because um, you know, there's also pressure. Like, okay, well, you know, you're trans, you're you're a woman, and I accept that. So now you have to fit all of the girl stereotypes. Yeah. You're not allowed to have any stereotypically masculine traits. So yeah. you know. If, you know, you're not allowed to be doing technology. You gotta like cooking. You gotta like cleaning. <laughs> yeah, that, that's yeah. the intro. And, well, and in so many ways, I feel like a bad feminist because I'm such a girly stereotype. Like honestly, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <so cool. sighs> Beth there, who was scratching her head at us talking about makeup. So you know. <laughs> yeah. What, what the hell is makeup? What the hell is a dress? <laughs> I one of those. And, uh, uh, still in college, I was forced to wear one until I yeah. Did. <laughs> oh yeah, she, she was lucky and went to one of those Christian colleges, so well, they would have. Oh there. yeah, yeah. Well, that's... try playing the French horn in a skirt. Ew, that yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. They weren't yeah, very beautiful. Yeah, I was like, um, excuse me, I play French horn. I ain't wearing a skirt. <laughs> And you get that thing all like curled up in a skirt. That would not be good. <laughs> but I, I, I do find it funny with the quote gender roles because I do cook, I do clean, I have no choice. You know, I do quote girly things. But in a sense, in, in any of the relationships I've been in, I've had no choice. If I didn't do it, it didn't get done. I mean, right. I'm like, I'm I'm actually like a domestic diva. 
Yeah. I kind of hate it except for the cookie part because I yeah. I mean that's what I am. I have, you know, that's what I do for a living. But then again, there's a more I guess you would say masculine side. I mean, I played hockey, I played softball, played soccer, played football, you know. Uh I do did woodwork. I do all my own, you know, when I I don't know the apartment I live down, but I did all my own wiring, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so it's like there is really I mean, you got you do what you gotta do. Yeah. I mean I lived by myself for a number of years and, and I had to like figure out how to fix shit in the house and you know if, without duct if tape? Needed, no, actually without duct tape usually. I, yeah. I was big on staple guns. <laughs> My staple <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. We're gonna have to, we're gonna yeah, have to see, trade, see, I'm a lesbian with, on that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a lesbian with, with no duct tape and no tools at the moment. Well, see, I in my old apartment because uh, I moved there in like '95, so it was like before wireless and stuff. I had five televisions and I had coax like stapled oh, all over God. the second baseboard. Nice. <laughs> See, now I have a tablet and wireless internet, but you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and now I'm using my I'm using my seven inch big iPad to yep. to talk to you in freaking Canada. <laughs> exactly. Well, and Beth's over in Pennsylvania, so right. we're all over. <laughs> but now I, another uh, I think challenge for you because going along with that idea is like okay, if you're transitioning, you're a woman, then you know you have to be exactly as we perceive women to be, that goes with sexual orientation as well. And yeah, that's absolutely. not cut and dried ever either. And I think a lot of people don't compute that. And that that's, was a little different for you as well, yes? Callie? Well, oh. uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> the, my screen okay. froze for a second. Oh, um, okay. But yeah, on, on sexual orientation, so the thing that we always say about gender identity is that it's a spectrum, right? Yeah. It's, there, there's not just a male and female binary. There's you know, all kinds of space in between and people who identify in all spaces in between. Um, you know, being trans, if you're born with a penis, doesn't mean that you identify as a woman necessarily. Um, yeah. you know, there's gender queer, agender, bigender, third gender. Um, mm -hmm. There's all kinds of space in that spectrum. And sexual orientation is the same way. You're not exactly. just gay, straight, or bi. Um, I mean, some people are. I'm bi, but mm -hmm. you know, some people are pansexual. Um, some people explore, and you know, they go their entire lives thinking like, "Well, I'm just I'm hetero, no big deal," and yep. and because the, they never even consider the possibility uh, because of the cultural programming we get. Yes. That you know there may be there may be another side to that, and um, you know one of the things that I always try and be careful about, right? Sexual orientation and gender identity obviously aren't the same thing, right? That's gender right. identity is who I am. Sexual orientation is who I'm romantically and sexually attracted to. Um, yes. But I was never able to figure out my sexual orientation until I came to terms with my gender identity and accepted myself, and then I was able to honestly make that exploration. Um, you know, before I would, I thought that I had honestly asked, my, you know, consider the question like, "Are you attracted to guys?" And you know, I would look at like a bunch of guys that were supposed to be hot, and I'm like, "Nah, doesn't do anything for me. Okay, no big deal." And not a bit of you know, like being grossed out by gay people or whatever. That's stupid. But yes. it was just like, no, that's that's not my thing. Um, but the more I'm able to you know, to accept myself, the more I'm able to be honest about what I want, you know, in that way, and I finally figured out, like, I actually am bi, I like guys and girls, so, yeah. party for everyone. Well, <laughs> 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 uh, you there, there is often a, um, people get that confused, it's like, well, if you're trans, then you must be gay, or, or some you know, configuration of that, and they are completely separate things. Yep, absolutely. I know, um, I mean, I know people from all across the gender spectrum uh, who are all across the sexual orientation spectrum. 
Uh, there's if you if you make an assumption, I can guarantee you're going to be wrong at some point. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And what you were saying too, for you, your biggest, I guess, apprehension was how you would be perceived in the greater world. And so, how has that been for you so far? Mm -hmm. Um, it's. Yeah, you know, the the better I get. See, it's it's a little easier for me because I do identify along the binary. Like, I'm just I'm just a girl. Yeah. Um, and and a femme one at that. So, you know, I like wearing dresses and skirts and makeup, and I like, you know, having hair that looks like I spent time on it and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a little easier for me to be read the way that I actually feel. Right. by the general public than it is for a lot of trans people. Um, you know, and, and that it's been a lot better than I've expected. The thing that the thing that I that I always try and tell people is, you know, I'm thinking about it and worrying about it constantly. But if I'm at the grocery store, every person I pass has got their own dick going on. Yeah. They are they are too busy wrapped up in whatever it is they've got going on to even notice, let alone care. Yeah. Um, and and that's going to be different depending on where you live. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're in an area that's generally intolerant, obviously that's probably not going to be your experience. Um, but you know, I mean, I live in Cincinnati, Ohio, has a reputation for being a pretty conservative town, but that hasn't really borne out in my experience. I mean, there are idiots here. Obviously, there <laughs> always are. Yeah. But I mean, the LGBT community here is amazing. Uh, we have a gay guy on Cincinnati City Council. Um, the, all of the major LGBT organizations are well represented here. The, I mean, the people are... She froze up a little bit there. She, she froze. Still froze. Okay. Yep, she's... <laughs> she's the frozen. Okay. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute then, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and... Um, Hangouts out crashed. Sorry. Oh, there she goes. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, in but anyways, <laughs> yeah, so, but, but I mean, generally, you know, the, the more, the, generally the more confident I am, the, the more I get read as, you know, the way that I want to be read. Um, and that makes sense. It does. Like it, it's like if you see somebody out in public who looks very sort of timid and and you know keeps to themselves and, and gives off an air of of um, vulnerability, that's the kind of person that might be more at risk to say get mugged in a parking lot. That you know what I mean? Like you, mm -hmm. you put out that I'm vulnerable and I'm afraid and I'm you know I'm I'm don't have that confidence, and so it makes sense that like because I know when I go out I always make sure that I give off an air of don't fuck with me and right. no one has, <laughs> and no one has ever fucked with me. Now that could be a false correlation. I don't know, but I like to right. go with that. So if you go out there and you're like, I'm Callie and I'm a hot babe, then right. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's going to go along with that. And well, it's going to help people get that vibe from you like, hey, that's, that's, a, that's not just that's a woman. Big deal. And, and, and that's, you know, I, that's why I can't stress the importance of a support system enough. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, you know, my, from my friends, my family... Um, you know the the LGBT community here, the the atheist community. The more I've gotten involved, uh, the you know the support and the love and the affirmation that I get has been absolutely instrumental in uh, in, in me being comfortable with who I am and me being able to be where I am. Um, you know that's one of the <laughs> one of the things that kind of makes me uncomfortable sometimes is when people say that, you know, that I'm brave or that what I do takes courage. And on one hand, I, I kind of want to do take credit for that because, frankly, it's fucking terrifying to be a trans person. I can um, imagine. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, it's... 
I have to do this to live. It's not a matter of me having courage. It's a matter of me doing this because I have to. And part of the reason, most of the reason that I've been able to do it is because of all the support that I've received from my friends, my family, the LGBT community, the support groups that I've gone to and all of that. Yeah. So, you know, the, you know, the person here talking to you who is super confident and not self-conscious um, that's that's not a person that I built on my own, mm-hmm. um, and so that's why I can't stress the importance of you know being a vocal supporter and being an ally and letting people know like, hey, you know, like I mean, being trans is lonely. Like, oh yeah, you know, we're like one, two, three percent of the population. Maybe there just aren't many of us out there. Yeah. But and. If- if you get in an area that's, you know, ultra conservative or, you know, backwards redneck like where I grew up and it's like even if there was a trans person out there, they're not going to come out and say so and no one out there is going to even think that that would exist, you know, like exactly. or they're going to get run out of town. Right. Yeah. What happened I mean, here? I, I was thinking about when when I was a Christian, it never was like the whole um, anti-gay and, and anti-trans thing was never an issue for me and not because the type of Christianity I was involved in would have been accepting because they wouldn't it's because I never knew or at least knew that I knew a gay person or a trans person and mm-hmm. it just never came into my sphere of reference because it was just didn't happen but then you know we had we didn't have any other races around either, so I was like, Ooh, right. there's people who are like, oh, wow. You know, yeah. and that's kind of enclosed sort of backwoods place I grew up in. Well, and, and you know, I still find myself surprised, and, and I shouldn't be, but, like, obviously this is the world that I live in every day. I mean, I do, I mean, I do the podcast, but I am... I'm becoming more and more heavily involved in my local LGBT community. So, like, this is the world that I live in. And then I still sometimes have to turn around and explain to somebody what does it mean to be transgender? Like, what does that word even mean? Yes. Yes. And <laughs> and I'm like I'm like whoa, wait a minute. Like, there's still there's still some way to go here. And and a lot of times it's not even been a problem. You know, it's I'm in you know an atheist group on Facebook that I've never been in. And I mentioned something about being a trans person. And somebody's like, you know what? I've heard people say that. What does that even mean? And I explain it. They're like, oh, cool. Thanks for telling me. And, like, I mean, it's not even a big <laughs> like, deal. Yeah, it was yeah, a big deal. Yeah, it's just, you know, oh, I didn't know that. Please educate me. And... Right, and, th- and that is, frankly, the best. Like, I will take a person who admits that they don't know anything, and I will handhold you through Trans 101, 201, 301, like... Yeah. To the advanced courses and the fucking PhD, um, awesome. and and I'll and I'll love every minute of it mm-hmm. before I'll deal with someone who thinks they know what they're talking about and has never even met somebody like me. Yeah. And and it's like because as I say, I I knew someone that I worked with who came out to transition at work, and but that only happened about a month and a half before we all got laid off. So. I had a little bit of interaction with her, but I didn't really get a chance to to kind of acclimate to that whole scenario and learn very much about it. So that's why this is kind of important to me because I do want to be the best ally that I can be, and I totally recognize that I don't know shit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like there's there's so many nuances, and like you and I were talking, you know, just before about. Um, terminology and just how mm-hmm. important very minute details can be to you and I wouldn't even realize that I had misspoken because I just don't know any different you know and there's a lot of people out there I think that are like that that really want to be an ally but they just feel kind of well I don't know a damn thing and I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings or I don't want to stick my foot in it and and things like that so it's so important I think for us to talk like this and have these dialogues and and be like hey you're trans and that's cool teach me I want to know <laughs> right well, yeah, and that's um, you know there's a lot of times there's there's a perception of 
you know, trans people or, or even, you know, broader uh, gay people um, of being, like, you know, PC liberal, like, language police or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, like, personally, I, I fucking hate the term politically correct because it's not, it, it's not about being politically correct. It's about not being an asshole. That too. And, um, you know, it's not about... It's not about someone's hurt feelings. It's about a culture of discrimination and a culture of violence surrounding whatever the object of that language is. Yes. So, you know, for example, the, 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 thing, the thing that I see probably the most, especially in the atheist community, is I can't tell you how many times I've been put into a position of arguing people who, arguing with people who insult Ann Coulter. Mm. And I tell you, there is not a situation in the world that pisses me off more than it looking like I'm defending Ann Coulter. Yeah, so, she's not, not very nice. <laughs> no, she is awful. She is one of the worst <laughs> human beings to ever live on the planet. But here's the thing, like, whenever she says something stupid, which is usually any time she opens her mouth. She opens her right? mouth, yes. So... There are memes all over Facebook basically talking about how she's a man, pointing out or making a joke yeah. about her having a dick. And no. <laughs> that's and, not and, <laughs> Well, right. And and, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like, so, like, because you don't like her, it's okay to insult her because a woman that has a penis or a woman with an Adam's apple or a woman with a quote-unquote manly-looking face, like, that's a terrible thing to have, right? You yeah. re realize that is directly insulting to me. Like, that's an insult that I've had lobbed at me in a hateful way. Yeah. And if you say that as an insult to one person, you're saying that as an insult to everyone, whether mm -hmm. you like that person or not. Using an insult like that doesn't become okay because you don't like someone. Right. You know, using using racial slurs against black or Latino people because they piss you off, not okay. Yes. Calling somebody, you know, using a, a, a homophobic slur yes. doesn't become okay because you don't like someone. You know, yeah, those, like, those things aren't okay because they're not fucking okay in any situation, under any circumstance, period. That's right. And, I mean, like, I would insult Ann Coulter, but I would be more tempted to call her a stupid, bigoted bitch than to... There it say, is. Yeah. <laughs> it, is <laughs> like, not, it is not hard to insult her <laughs> without insulting other people unintentionally. Like, that can is I not call her a whore? Yes, you can call her that, too. I mean... Well, that's insulting to horses, but okay. No. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> but you know the the thing a thing that doesn't get a lot of play in the media anymore, um, especially when it comes to trans people, is the violence that the LGBT mm -hmm. community in general faces, and trans people specifically. Um, I mean, we have I don't know if there's been any more, but you know, recently it's been in the news. I mean, eight trans women have died in the last like 35 days. Um, Three more you know, this past week. Yeah, and and you know. To be fair, the circumstances surrounding all of them aren't a hundred percent clear. It's not sure, like it's not for sure if they were all hate crimes. But I mean, the the fact is, trans women are being killed, especially trans women of color. Yeah. Um, so you know the insults and the language. Oh, right. Yeah. And you know the the demeaning language and the dehumanization, like that, that all contributes to that. And you, and that's why that stuff isn't okay. Like, even you know, just joking around in front of people. Like, you know, those are things that that actually are used against us. And trans people, not all trans people. I I, I absolutely I absolutely am not a spokesperson for trans people. Um, but many trans people are in an incredibly vulnerable situation already. Yes. And and a lot of times you hear things like that in an environment that's supposed to be a safe place. Um you know, yeah. I've I've been in groups before somebody made a joke about vegetarians, right? I'm vegetarian, whatever. That's a different conversation. <laughs> but um I forget exactly what the joke was, but somebody said something about like, you know, ask a vegetarian guy about his vagina. 
or something like that. And I'm what? just like, like, like that doesn't even compute to me. <laughs> right, because because being vegetarian makes you like a woman, and we all know being a woman is the worst thing ever, right? Oh, for fuck's sakes. <laughs> Can I and, clock that, whoever that was? <laughs> right. And and it's things like this, like if if you're not if you're not the kind of person who has those things actually said to you as real insults and those things are actually used to demean and humiliate you, like Part of me can kind of see why you may not think it's a big deal, um, yeah. but it is a big deal. <laughs> like it's a really big deal. It um, absolutely is. like I can't I, like to call Aunt Coulter or a man is just like why would you want to insult people with penises? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, nothing wrong with nothing wrong with having a penis. Nothing wrong with having a vagina. Unless you don't want one, then then you know you can try and figure that out. But. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> then you know we'll decide what works yeah. in that way. <laughs> right. So, uh, well, let's take a little break. Um, it's, I'm gonna play us our uh, creation moment for this week, and uh, yeah, you'll enjoy this. And um, for those of you who are in our our little secret group, yes, it's time for my screen on the tattoo haters. So, oh, yes. Gosh. Is this real? Like, is this a real thing? Yes, this is a real thing. Yeah. Oh my god. Um, I thought they were trolls. Yeah. No, they're not. They are not. Wow. So, give me a moment here. <laughs> oh, I need another screen. Anyone wants to be our patron and send me money so I can buy a new screen? That'd be good. Please. <laughs> <laughs> one moment. I may have one. It's coming. It's slow. Come on. Come on, computer. There we go. Behold, the atheist nightmare. Your well-made banana. Just the right shape for human mouth. Chewy, easy to digest. It's even curved toward the face to make the whole process so much easier. I choose to believe in the arts. When we do that, when we understand that creation is the truth, then we understand where all of our doctrine comes from as well. I just want to let you know that there actually is a book out there that actually tells us where matter came from. Uh, Bill, I do want to say that there is a book out there. So next time you hear on television somebody say millions of years ago, what's the question we're going to ask them? Were you there? Were you there? Call them up on the telephone and say, excuse me, Mr. TV man, were you there? Only way we could know what happened in the past if someone was there to tell us. That's right, dinosaurs live beside people. And of course, you'll have an evolutionist who'll say, that's not right, dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. What do you ask them? Were you there? Hello and welcome to this week's Creation Moment. A little slice of creation silliness I get in my email every day and I'd like to share it with you so that we can all get a taste of just how crazy creation shit is. On this week's Creation Moment, we're going to talk about tattoos. Now, you might wonder what Taylor could possibly have to say about tattoos. I'm kind of curious, too. So, let's see what kind of goofball idea he has this week. While people have been getting tattoos for thousands of years, people of faith have avoided them. The Old Testament explicitly forbids God's people from getting tattooed. It might be argued that believers in God have refused to get tattooed because they view the body as the Holy Spirit's temple. But new research is beginning to suggest that there is more to the issue than that. First of all, God's people in the Old Testament were Jewish, so Taylor's not off to a good start here. Secondly, this is not new research. The study he's going to talk about is from 1999, 16 years ago. Ugh. All right, well, let's see what he has to say. Dr. William Cardasis, a Michigan criminal psychiatrist, sees a possible link between criminal behavior and tattoos. In his study of 55 patients at a maximum security hospital, he has found statistical links between sociopathic behavior and the tendency to wear tattoos. Wow. So, as you may have figured, I looked this shit up. The study is pretty ridiculous. Dr. Cardassus did not use 55 patients, which is already a poor sample size. He used only 36 patients. Patients 
an institution for the criminally insane who were either declared unfit to stand trial or not guilty by reason of insanity. So he's already using people who have been diagnosed with mental illness. That's like going to a football game to find out if football players wear shoulder pads and tight pants. Not exactly good methodology. He found that patients with tattoos were much more likely to have no regard for the rights of others, to behave impulsively and lie and steal with no remorse. Another study of cadavers in New York City showed that the bodies of teen drug addicts had twice the number of tattoos as found in the general population. So what is actually being referenced here is antisocial personality disorder. Dr. Cardassus is using a study of people who, as I said, he knows already have mental illness to determine if having tattoos can indicate a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. Do you think any self-respecting psychiatrist would use tattoos as a predictor of mental illness? I sure as hell don't. However, this was also a men's facility, so Barring any catastrophic injuries that aren't mentioned, we can assume that 100% of the study participants had penises. There's also a high proportion of Christians in prisons. So, based on Dr. Cardassus's flawed correlation, we can also assume that Christian men are predisposed to a high incidence of antipersonality disorder or being criminally insane. Bravo, Dr. Cardassus! As for the drug addict corpses, Correlation is not an indicator of cause. If that were true, I have a great bit of, quote, evidence that proves climate change is caused by a lack of pirates. Arg. But do continue. One tattoo artist told the press that he refuses to tattoo the face, the neck, or the hands. He points out that some people consider tattoos in these places to be serial killer territory. Dr. Cardasis adds simply that having a tattoo doesn't mean one is a criminal. It just depends on what the tattoo means to the person wearing it. Getting a tattoo is a permanent commitment to the symbol represented by the tattoo. Believers should have a permanent commitment only to Jesus Christ. Serial killer territory? Are you fucking kidding me? I've been interested in serial killers for many years and I've read about quite a few of them. Charles Manson, who isn't technically even a serial killer, is the only one I can think of with a tattoo on his face. I googled to find more and I could not find one serial killer with tattoos on their hands, neck, or face. I guess listening to some random tattoo artist wasn't the greatest bit of research, was it, Mr. Taylor? And implying that certain types of tattoos or the meanings of certain tattoos can actually mean that someone's automatically a criminal for having one? You know what? Fuck you, Mr. Taylor. Just fuck you. The prayer is pretty lame this week. Thank you, Lord, for making my body the temple of the Holy Spirit. Um, wouldn't that be considered some kind of possession? Hmm. Better call the Ghostbusters. Special thanks this week to everyone who sent me pictures of their fantastic tattoos. You are a wonderful group of people from all walks of life, and all of you are valued members of society and the atheist and skeptic community. The artwork represents many people and things that we value and different times in our lives. Some are relevant today, and some represent the past. Some even represent deep and abiding love, like Shujin Tribble's Red Kanji, a testament to the love he holds for his wife, whom he lost nearly a decade ago to one of the real evils in this world, cancer. Tattoos might not be for everyone, but I think I can speak for all of us who have ink and enjoy it when I again say, fuck you, Mr. Taylor. And that was this week's Creation Moment. So, yeah, that's a real thing. <laughs> Man, fuck that guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, yeah, uh, exactly. You, you could see, I, I got that in my email the other day, and I was like, you fucker, how dare you? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed uh, busting that stupid study. Like, 
come on, you're going to go to a, a, a psychiatric a high security facility to find out, you know, who has more mental illness? Like, really? <laughs> well, like, in his study of 55, you're done. You're done. You, you, you don't get further than that. And when I looked it up, it was only 36. I don't know where they got oh, the 53. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. I, uh, we lost Beth. Now, um, she wasn't feeling the best, so she may not be back, but we will soldier on, as it were. So, yeah, that, that's uh, I get one of those in my email uh, about every day, so it makes uh, great show fodder. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, speaking of tattoos, yes. I have a trans-related tattoo. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it very well on my camera. Let's see, let's see. Oh, yes! I can see some of that for Hope to... Okay. Yep. I made a throne for Hope to sit, is what it says. Oh, wonderful! Um, I, I see that when I, when I watched your uh, video of your speech, uh, you mentioned it, I think. Yes! Um, so... Um, I'm really into a band called La Dispute, and they uh, they have a song called The Last Lost Continent, and it's it's basically just about um, you know finding strength and shared struggles, and you know taking apart all the things that that you struggle with, and um, you know one of the the big the most impactful lines in the song is I made a throne for hope to sit, so um, I thought that kind of that kind of defines. Um, definitely where I was when I got it, and, and, and I think still kind of where I am now, although it's more, um, I mean, I mean, I'm in a pretty good place in life right now. I obviously have struggles of my own, like everybody does, but, um, you know, now it kind of references more what I'm trying to be for other people, um, you know, either with the, the, you know, the podcast or, you know, the volunteer stuff that I do, um, just kind of trying to make the world suck shit less. (laughs) <laughs> um, for other people who are, yeah, for people who, I mean, you know, people who aren't lucky enough to have the support system that I have, um, yeah. you know, people who have legitimate fears about, um, you know, losing everything. I mean, I know people who have lost all their family, all their friends, their job, their yeah. house, you know, their... I don't understand that mindset of, you know, because you don't fit into my predetermined you know, cubby hole that I think you should fit in, I'm going to reject you. I, I just, maybe I'm just a, a different mindset. I don't know, but that kind of shit just never computed to me. I just, yeah. yeah. You, and, and, you know, there's obviously, there's an adjustment that has to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, you spend your whole life presenting to the world as one person and all of a sudden everyone around you finds out like, oh no, there's this other thing, by the way. And you know, and that's going to be weird for people. That's going to be that's going to be a difficult thing for people, um, mm-hmm. and and that's okay. You know, there's um, you know there's a mourning period that some people go through. Um, mm-hmm. I I have literally nothing bad to say about my mom through this whole process, but it's been kind of hard on her. Um, yeah. You know, figuring out that like oh actually I don't actually have a son. I have a daughter, who is a different name than the one that I named her. And, um, you know, all of that sort of, sort of mom stuff, like, um, so, you know, it's been, it's been difficult for her, but she's been behind me a hundred percent of the way. Um, and that's, I think the mark of a good parent and, and a supportive, you know, family or, or friend is, you know, you're allowed to be thrown off and you're allowed to as you say maybe grieve for who you thought that person in your life was but that doesn't mean that you need to reject who they actually are Mm -hmm. just because of that like because I've I've heard of people who get well um, because you're not that person or you're not presenting as that person that I want to have in my life then fuck you and I don't want you I, I just I don't know it it just doesn't, doesn't compete for me. Yeah, I um one of my best friends, not uh, not too long after I came out, um he was he was one of my closest friends that I came out to first. Um, you know I I had that conversation with him. I was like, look, I know this is like it's gonna be weird. It's gonna be awkward. Like, I don't want you to feel like 
you know, there's all, all of a sudden, like, this space in between us that, you know, we can't talk about stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a day or two later, he sent me a really long message on Facebook, and he was like, look, I love you. I want you to be happy. I want you to do this. But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm struggling, and, you know, here's what I'm feeling. Here's what's going through my mind. Here's what I'm worried about. And, and it hurt. I mean, it hurt really bad to read that stuff because I knew that, you know, that this was an action that I was taking and coming out and transitioning that was causing him to yes. hurt. Yes. But I was glad that he felt like he could say that to me. And, yes. and, and, you know, the, basically the close of his message was like, you know, this is, this is going to be hard, but the solution is never to run away. The solution is to figure it out and deal with it because right. at the end of the day, it's about you and about you being happy. You're one of my best friends. I love you. I want you to be happy. So this has to happen. Make it happen. Yes. Um, you know, so just, you know, keeping an open dialogue. I mean that – and, you know, there are still those things from time to time. I mean I, for all practical purposes, kind of live on a different planet than all of the people that I knew before transition. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because I, I have this whole life experience of, you know, getting on hormones and going through puberty a second time at 30. So much fucking fun, by the <laughs> way. Um, <laughs> you know, all of those things that yep. um, that are unique experiences that I can't necessarily relate to someone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I think it, it's important that, you know, your friend, he, he gave you that message of support and communicating that you have issues and feelings and things that you're trying to work through. I mean, I, to me, that's, that's an open and honest thing. Like, you're not going to just be like, oh, okay, and carry on like nothing ever happened. That's, that's unrealistic, right? right. And, and I think for you, you, like you said, it, it bothered you that your actions, no matter what they were, the intent was, was hurting your friend. You know, that was never what you set out to do. You set out to be your authentic self. And unfortunately, that's going to cause issues somewhere to somebody that's just unavoidable. But having that open dialogue, I think, is so important just to say... You know, whether or not, and, and we talk about this on my other show, that feelings don't always make sense. You have feelings, and the feelings are valid, whether they make intellectual sense or not. And Absolutely. Dealing, <laughs> dealing with the feelings, whether they make sense or not, is what needs to happen. And so that's what your friend is saying. He's like, well, I love you, and I want you to be happy, but I have all these weird feelings, and I need to figure that out. And that's mm -hmm. the honest and open way to deal with it. Yep, and that's, and, and I mean, that's the way that we have dealt with it, and you know, there have been times where I feel like, you know, we're not relating the way that we used to or that, you know, we're kind of drifting apart just because we live in different worlds. And, you know, when I feel like this is happening, I call him and I'm like, dude, like, we got to talk. And, you know, we'll spend two or three hours just talking about stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the – and that was one of the biggest things that I – like – I was never worried about my friends being like, well, you know, this isn't something I can handle. But I just worried about us kind of drifting apart because all of a sudden we're different people now. Yes. Um, and, you know, the thing that, that I have come to realize is obviously, you know, being trans and going through transition is, is a very unique experience. There's not really anything that you can compare it to. But, you know, there are a lot of things that are like that, and your friends don't have to understand it or get it to help you through it. Um, you know, yeah. if, if there's a person with cancer, other people with cancer aren't the only ones who can support them through that. That's a good analogy, yeah. Um, you know, if there are – I mean, any situation in life. I was – one of my best friends, uh, his dad died when we were 18. And I helped, I, you know, kind of helped him through that. And I'm 30 years old and I've never lost anyone close to me. I know it's going to happen eventually, but that's not, I mean, that's not an experience that I can identify with even at 30 years old. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that I can't be there for somebody who's going through that 
So I kind of had to realize that about my friends. You know, they love me. They want to be here for me. It doesn't necessarily matter that, you know, I can tell them what going through puberty at 30 is like and they don't understand it. They don't have to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All they need to do is say, I'm here. I am standing with you. I support you. If you need somebody to talk to or to listen, I'm here, whatever. But they don't have to know exactly what it is. I mean, people do that. They support family and friends with experiences that they've never had all the time. And, and it's it's quite normal to do that and there's nothing wrong with not necessarily if you don't know what to do for the person ask them right exactly the the phrase what can I do to help you is so powerful mm -hmm. um, and, and sometimes there may not be an answer to that question or at least not like a you know a, a concrete answer you know sometimes the best thing that somebody can do is just say hey I love you yeah. And you know, I do that for my friends all the time. If I know they're if if I know they're in a bad mood, I just take a picture and say, "Hey, I love you," and I send them a picture of myself smiling, and I say, "I love you." Um, <laughs> you know, like I mean, because you know, being in atheist groups and you know, doing the podcast, like I've met so many people that aren't easily accessible to me, oh. and and first of all, it drives me fucking crazy because I'm a hugger, um, uh like such a hardcore hugger. I hate shaking hands with people. I just want to hug everyone. <laughs> um, but obviously I can't do that. So, yep. you know, what can I do? Well, I can send them a picture of my smiling face for what it's worth and tell you <laughs> I love you. Um, when, it, when it warms up a bit, you can come up here and give me a hug at some point, but I don't recommend yes, coming right now. <laughs> absolutely. Well, it's probably not a whole lot different. It's been like minus 20 here all week. Okay, yeah, it's minus 18 right now, so yeah. yeah. I don't think it's yeah. quite there now. It's it's a little bit better today, but uh, I drove I drove by Cincinnati uh, in 2013 on the way to Kentucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's you know a lot of people hate on Cincinnati, frankly, and um, I mean I'm not gonna be like oh my god Cincinnati's the best place ever, but like I don't really see what's to hate honestly. If you didn't like it, you wouldn't still be there probably. <laughs> Well, I'm here because of my friends and my family. Like, you know, if I could, if I could pick up my friends and family and move somewhere, maybe I would. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's. Uh, I have to say, Ohio is kind of the most boring state I've ever driven through. But I haven't been to like you know Kansas or anything. So. <laughs> well, I've I've driven out that way. You know, when we were when we were doing our tour, like we made it we made it as far out as Texas and. Um, and there's a whole lot of nothing out there in the middle of the U.S. I mean, I get what you're saying. Ohio is pretty boring. Like, I mean, there's Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati, and not much in between. That's probably going to offend a lot of people, but <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> especially my one friend that I told you about because she lives yeah. in not one of those places in Ohio. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was excited. I was excited when we drew, drove by five dollar foot long Jesus. You know, I was like, "Hey, I know what that oh, is." Oh, yeah! I told you he's he was like uh, he's like twenty minutes up the highway from me. Yes, yes. I I didn't even know that that was on the way where we were going, and I was like, oh, "I know that church." Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where I used to work, I used to drive. Uh, I used to drive up to Dayton sometimes, and that's there's and and of course there's two flea markets mm -hmm. next to that church. Which is just, that's just perfect. <laughs> I just thought it was so funny that Jesus committed suicide, you know, and burned, touched down Jesus. <laughs> oh, no, he was struck by lightning. It was an act yeah. of God. Yeah, so I mean, he committed suicide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I'm slow. That took me a minute, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Because you know he oh, sacrificed himself man. to himself, and then later he blew himself up and right, melted. Himself. Right, right, right. Although I think oh. they should have left Terminator Jesus there because that was pretty epic looking. Oh the, yeah, the wireframe oh, thing. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yes. man. And I, I was I was working in Mexico when that happened, and I, I found it. I think somebody posted it on Facebook or something. I was like, oh, my God, you got to look at this. Like, Jesus committed suicide. And my the people I was living with, they're 
um, mostly Americans from California, and they're like, yeah, so I'm like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> yeah, totally over their heads, but, you know. <laughs> they, uh, there's a, there's a, a song on YouTube, if you haven't seen it, look it up. It's called Big Butter Jesus. Oh, I will have to look it up, because my friend, my friend Dave, I, I made some mention about Touchdown Juice Week. No, 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 that's Big Butter Jesus, so... Yeah, he did kind of look like butter. I gotta yeah, say. Yeah, well, and that's yeah, that's the joke. <laughs> One of the lines in the song is "Can't believe it's not Jesus." <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you saw in in the creation moment. One of the uh, the tattoos on there was a, a really good uh, zombie Jesus, and then yes. uh, as I went around, there was zombie Mary next to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that one a lot. Zombie Jesus, baby. He's like beating people with his the part of his cross, but <laughs> awesome. And so I'm going to take another little break, and Beth um, prepared another preview of her uh, blog, Havoc and Chaos. And yeah, we talked about anti vaxxers before, and uh, as some of you may know, uh, Beth has has been uh, diving deep into that insanity, and she is offering us uh, a peek into uh, her rather large forthcoming blog posts on anti vaxxers and Bill Maher, which. I like him as an atheist, but I don't understand why he's all goofy about the vaccinations, but eh, to each their own, I guess. But uh, let's take a look at uh, Beth's Havoc in Chaos preview for this week. When my computer decides to load. Because I have too much stuff and it hates me. <laughs> there we go. From my friends to my weekly tirade. Once again anti-vax dipshittery has raised my hackles. This time, Bill Mayer. And yes, I swear, so if you have sensitive ears, you may want to listen to something else for a few moments. Now, I had originally planned on a much more thorough approach to Mayer's bullshit, but the more I dug, the more stuff I found. What started out as small, well, it's kind of grown into a major diatribe and my head is spinning in anti-vax shit. This is what Mayer said on February 6th. It is highly edited for time and focuses just on his derp. Never mind his guess. Okay, so uh, let's first talk about the uh, topic that's getting everybody crazy in America, measles, and what goes on here. And, you know, when I start these conversations, I always have to say, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, never have been. I'm an anti-flu shot guy, because I think that's bullshit. And I think the fact that it was 23% effective this week, bears that out. Okay, but, uh, you know, if Ebola was airborne, I'd get the vaccine tomorrow. Can you do too much of a good thing? Because America loves to do that. We certainly went overboard with antibiotics. But in 1983, they gave a third of what they give now. Is it limitless? Are there no amount that is too much? You know, um, there have been no long-term studies about groups of people who get a lot of vaccinations versus groups of people who don't. I'm not so sure that people who get a lot of them have as robust an immune system. And there's an awful lot of maladies that we didn't used to have or have now in much greater numbers. Allergies, a lot more colds <laughs> and ear infections and asthma and, and autoimmune disorders and chronic fatigue, all this shit. I'm not saying the vaccines cause them. I'm saying... I think there's a lot of environmental factors that causes this shit. And if your immune system is not up to par, and you know, when you don't use your immune system, we're, we're not really looking at the bigger picture of this when, you, when, when your body doesn't get a workout. I mean, that is what happens in the human body sometimes. You know, right, when, you, when you ate it like that, it doesn't think it has to do the job so well. Because of length, as I mentioned, I'm going to focus in on just one statement he makes. Can you do too much of a good thing? Is it limitless? Are there no amount that is too much? In other words, Mayer is asking if the vaccine schedule is too much, too fast, or too much, too soon. Now here's my problem. You see, one of Mayer's claims is that he is not an anti-vaxxer. He's only anti-flu, yada, yada, yada. Well. Sorry to say, 
If the shoe fits, Mr. Mayor, then stop repeating long discredited anti vaccine talking points as though they were scientifically valid. That's what anti vaccinationists do. And if you continue to do such things, you shouldn't be surprised when people conclude that you are anti vaccine. It's a reasonable conclusion based on your own words and failure to be educated over the course of many years. Let me explain. Initially, or I really should say, an early complaint among the anti-vax crowd blamed autism rates on the vaccine preservative, the Marisol. When it was removed from vaccines in, in about 2001, and autism rates continued to rise, Effective parents shifted the goalposts and decided that it was the vaccine schedule that was the problem. Now this too many too soon hypothesis has actually been around and gained a lot of ground in 2008 with the Green Hour Vaccines Rally which included Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Jim Carrey, and our fave Jenny McCarthy. What we are saying is that the number of vaccines given and the ingredients like the freaking mercury, the ether, the aluminum, the antifreeze need to be removed immediately. This may sound familiar. The number of vaccines given, and she focuses in also on the ingredients like the freaking mercury, the ether, the aluminum, yada yada. Hmm, 2008-2015, okay, yeah, so this greener vaccine is in essence a two-pointed attack. There is a toxin gambit, which deals with the specific ingredients of uh, the vaccines, which would be like the marisol, or the actual antigens which would be the bacterial or viral proteins designed to evoke the protective immune response. But there's also a flip side to this, which deals with the number of shots and or the timing at what age and at what speed that the shots are received. And above McCarthy attacks the ingredients, where Mayer attacks the timing. So. What it boils down to is this toxin gambit. It's a tried and tested trope of the anti-vax movement. It's been used by people like Mike Adams, Dr. Jake Gordon, Kent Heckenlively, and of course McCarthy. Another name that pops up is Dr. Bob Sears. And it's just basically it consists of listing all sorts of scary sounding ingredients that are found in vaccines and then trying to argue that the vaccines are horrific cesspits of toxins because they contain trace amounts of formaldehyde, for example. It's a truly stupid brain dead gambit, but no matter how many times and for how long of a time it is slapped down, there will always be some ignorant anti-vaccinationists who will bring it back from the dead. So Mr. Mayor, if the shoe fits, the shoe fits. Now, as I said, I bit off more than I could chew with this one. And Mayor really, really gish gallops his way through his screed with no counterbalance whatsoever. Um, some articles that I read say, well, the conservative guy. He tried. Whether I do an additional voice commentary or I do one in print, I haven't really decided. But that's basically what's happening in my world. <laughs> now, Back to the show. Yeah. <laughs> we just love Jenny McCarthy. <laughs> oh, God. That shit is painful. It is. It, it really is. It's like, eh, how about, like, really educating yourself about what's in there? It, it, like, some of those things that they like to bitch about are in things that we interact with and eat and whatever all the time. And as somebody said, it's the amount that makes it toxic, not necessarily the substance in of itself. Because, you know, you can die of water poisoning. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the correlation causation thing, like, oh, you breathe air? You know who else breathed air? Hitler. Yeah. 
<laughs> you, Shut you up. Air Just breathing, stop. Air You're breathing. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, like, they should, they should have like a supreme Godwin for that, you know? <laughs> that's uh, like Godwin. That's like extra Godwin. <laughs> Man. Yeah, so that's uh that that's what uh, Beth spends her uh, free time uh, dealing with is uh, refuting that kind of ridiculousness. FSM so. bless her. I wouldn't have the energy. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> Although when she <laughs> when she saw my thing about tattoos, she was like, "Yeah, better you than me." <laughs> uh, yeah, that whole ass hattery. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, so, um, before we get into um, the whole how to be a good ally thing, um, as I say, I listened to um, a speech that you did that you have up on YouTube that I thought was really awesome, and part of that was this amazing poem that you wrote that kind of highlights the experience you had when people aren't exactly on their best behavior in public, right. and I was hoping you would share that with us because it's yes. really awesome. I would love to. Okay, so um, I call this a letter to the girl from Thornton's, and um, Thornton's is like a convenience store gas station chain for, I I don't know how, like, I know they're, like, regional. I don't know if they're national or international, so. I've never um, heard of them, but that's okay. Yeah, so just so that makes sense, when you hear Thornton's, that's what that means. (laughs) Gotcha. Okay. Dear girl from the Thorntons on Route 4 in Fairfield, Ohio, who was buying slushies with her dad and her sister around 3.30 p.m. on August 24, 2014. I saw you looking. It was a Sunday, by the way. I saw you looking. I saw you gently and nonchalantly nudge your sister. I saw you nod your head to the side in my direction, thinking you were being stealthy. I heard you whispering, though I couldn't tell what you were saying. But I knew what you were saying. Look at that dude who thinks he's a girl. You saw me, a girl with a quote-unquote man-shaped body. You saw a girl whose body was shaped by a lifetime of testosterone poisoning. You saw a he-she wearing a tank top with its bra straps hanging out. You saw the 5 o'clock shadow I don't have $4,000 to get rid of. You saw me wearing no makeup, which is sort of a privilege. Not many people get to see that, because I don't pass well with it, let alone without it. You saw my glasses, which I don't wear to help my vision, because my eyes are pretty good, actually. They just help me pass better. Or maybe not, apparently. I want to tell you what you didn't see. What you didn't see was the hour I spent working up the courage to leave my house wearing a tank top. You didn't see me trying to convince myself that I really look fine and that I should love my body because, after all, everyone's beautiful, right? You didn't see the mental back and forth I had about whether or not I should go in and grab a snack and an energy drink because I was worried about people doing exactly what you did to me. You didn't see that tiny bit of confidence I worked so hard for, draining so completely as I tried so hard to keep my face from turning red. You didn't see the tears I didn't cry because I can't let people like that get to me. You didn't see the good mood I was in slip away from me as I sunk back into the seat of my car on the way to the support group I go to in order to learn to cope with people like you. You also didn't hear the compliment I wanted to give you because, damn, the dress you were wearing was awesome. Your hair was really nice, too. You were really pretty, I thought. So... Girl from the Thorntons on Route 4 in Fairfield, Ohio, who was buying slushies with her dad and her sister around 3.30 p.m. on August 24th, 2014. My name's Callie. It was nice to meet you. Wow, that's really powerful. And it's it's the kind of thing that, you know, a lot of people just don't even think about. Like you said, they they were obviously trying to be nonchalant and discreet but obviously failed miserably <laughs> right and you know it and so i guess as a as a a person on the outside i guess you could say you know I, 
everybody has that urge. It's like, wow, I've never seen that before. And it's hard not to look at anybody who's different. And I mean, I was a goth and I used to like parade around wearing weird shit all the time. And <laughs> right. <laughs> I did that on purpose. You know, I wanted people to gawk at me. And, you know, when I got the old hey, Halloween's over, I was like, great, you could take the mask off now. That kind right. of thing. <laughs> But it's we, and I did know. the same thing. I had a reverse mohawk when I was 14. <laughs> 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 but, you know, it, it's it, when you and, – and sometimes we do that where we'll look at somebody who is different or unusual and we won't even notice until it's like, oh, shit, I'm staring, you know. And and mm. so I guess my question is, like, how do how does somebody like me deal with that when we realize we're doing something stupid like that? That's a great question. Um, smile and say hi. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, because the one thing, the one thing that I thought about, um, you know, after, be, because you know, this, the first of all, that is a literal literal retelling of something that happened to me. I really was on the way to a support group, ironically, when it happened. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you had good and, stuff to talk about when you got there, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, and, um, you know, and that was definitely when I was in not not the best place in life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a lot of struggles surrounding work, lots of self-confidence issues, lots of self-esteem issues. Um and you know, I was thinking I was thinking to myself, like, you know what, what if she wasn't laughing at me because I was trans? What if she was gawking at me because I'm fat? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Like I mean, not that that's really any better. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I just thought to myself, like, what if, you know, what if my what if my state of mind is just negatively coloring and I'm interpreting this whole thing wrong? And you're just being um, really sensitive about the wrong thing or something. Right. Um, but, I mean, you get to know the look. I imagine. Um, yeah. Because I've been fat my whole life. I know that look. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but, yeah, I mean, that, that's really the thing, like... Because you know, even looking isn't even really necessarily a thing because, I mean, I do that. When I'm right. in a room, I just kind of look around and see who's there. Yeah. You know, what what got to me was, like, you know, the whispering and the kind of snickering right. and the, like, nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of shit. Right. Like, that's kind of what got me. Mm -hmm. Like, if it had just been the look, it probably would not even have registered, you know, yeah. like... I would have just gone on about my day and not even, you know, not even a big deal. Yeah, that makes sense. Cuz um, I mean like I I like to look, to watch people myself and Sure, yeah. I, and see I am like a seriously nonconformist, like I hate conformity with a passion. So whenever I do see someone who's like really out there and really different, I tend to stare but more so out of a hey wow that's cool right yeah and like wow what's that person about right and, and it's right but then I'm conscious of it like oh I don't want them to think I'm being a dick because I'm I'm like, right the fact that they're being different like I was out at a concert last weekend in Toronto and I, I'm like an hour from Toronto and I used to club there all the time but I hadn't been clubbing there forever and you know this guy walked in with this like he he didn't he looked like a um um he was look, put it this way he wasn't uh obviously african american or anything like that but he had this giant afro and i was just like wow that's really cool you know right. and I, i'm like oh i can't stay you know it's like but then it turns out he was in one of the bands that were playing psycho stare at him when he was on stage so it was fine nice <laughs> you know <laughs> But you know, they and and when people walk in with you know, uh, weird leather jackets and metal shit on them and whatever, I want to stare because I want to be like, oh, is that something cool? Maybe I should look at one of those kind of things. Right. It, it's such a fine line, you know. And 
And then on the other hand side of that, when I first um, came to university here, I'm fresh off the farm, okay? I'm like farmer's daughter. We, and like I said before, if I ever knew a gay or trans person, I didn't know it because that didn't exist in my sphere of right. reference. I come here, and I mean, we're a city of a quarter million people, and I went to um, one of the biggest and best-known universities in the country, and when I went to the library, there was a there was a transgender person manning the kiosk as you go in and out because they like check your bag to make sure you're not like stealing library books and shit like that, and and she was obviously near the beginning of transition. So, and for me, it was very jarring because I'd never seen this before. And I think mm -hmm. now, I think I must have looked like such a bitch because I probably stared at the poor woman every time I went through because my poor little hick brain was just like, what am I looking at, you know? And, and it was nothing that I had a problem with. It was just that I just didn't know what to do with it because I'd never seen it before. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it, it's really hard because you know a lot of times even people with good intentions will um, and, and this hasn't this hasn't really happened to me at least not in person I, I've had people do the the same kind of thing online right. but you know the the problem is making assumptions based on what you think you see because you may be wrong yeah that's true too. Um, but, you know, people will be very eager to identify themselves as allies, and they'll make assumptions based on how someone looks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even that's not really something you want to do, because you may be wrong, and you may make the situation even worse. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it, and it's hard, because there are some trans people who, you know, if they've lost everything, you know, sometimes people can, I just want someone to love me. Yeah. Um, but some people have all the support that they want, and they don't want strangers, like, picking them out in a crowd. Oh, hey, you're a trans person. I want to let you know I think you're awesome. Yeah. You know, because, at the like, it's well-intentioned, but at the end of the day, like, it's just another reminder that I'm different. Yeah. yeah. And at the I mean at the end of the day what I think any of us really want is to just be accepted as who we are right. and for that to be no more significant than the color of our hair or the color of our eyes or you know um you know again like I mean I don't want to speak for the entire trans community um uh, because that's obviously I mean we're more diverse than probably even I realize. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, use my preferred name, use my preferred pronouns, treat me like you would any other woman. And that's really all there is to it. Well, we talked um, about that a little bit in terms of, um, the, the person that I was working with and I didn't. You know, like I said, I'd never encountered that situation before, and I just figured, you know what? Probably the best thing to do is continue on as if she's always been a woman and call her by her right name, and if I fuck up, say, I'm sorry, and, and you know, they should know, hopefully, that I, I didn't mean anything by it, and it was fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, that's another thing. Um, a lot of times, if, you know, somebody messes up, they accidentally use the wrong pronoun, they accidentally use the wrong name, obviously, there's an adjustment period. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my, my mom just started being able to use, to call me Callie on a regular basis, like, five or six months ago, and I've been at it for two years. Um, yeah. These things take time. Like, yep. I, obviously, that's understandable. Yeah. Um, but um, well, I totally lost my train of thought there. Holy crap! Oh, your friend, your yeah, your yeah. your coworker. Yes. Yes. Um, so, you know, the thing is, like, you accidentally use the wrong name. Correct yourself. Sorry. Move on. Does not yeah. need to be made a big deal. Yeah. Like. Uh -huh. If if you correct yourself, 
then I know you didn't mean it, and it's not a big deal. If you make it into, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I feel so terrible. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Like, not, not necessarily. Yeah. Like, yeah, it just, you know, you use the wrong name. Oh, move on. Sorry, yeah. you know, say the right name. Off you go. Or you say, you know, call, call her a guy. And like, oh, I'm sorry, girl, and, and move on. Yeah, yeah. It, the thing, the thing that I, the that I like to compare it to is like, you know how like, you know, your mom, your grandma, your aunt, whatever older relative you have, you, they always your get like you and your siblings get confused. <laughs> yeah. Like, it doesn't have to be any more significant than that. Like, yeah. like, hey Brad, I mean Amber, I mean Callie, you know, like, <laughs> like yeah, whatever, whatever the hell your name is, I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one that just broke something. Get over here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, so, it, yeah. It, it's good to know that kind of thing, though, because, like you say, you get the person that's just, like, goes falling all over themselves to try and apologize, and that's, that's going too far. And like you say, it just points out, again, that you're different, and that's what we right. want to try to avoid. You're, right, you're just... because... Different. Yeah, well, that's... You're a you person know, when, like when, everybody else. Right, well, and that's that's kind of... Like, obviously, you know, we're having a three-hour-long conversation about being trans, um, but in in regular, everyday life, I think the most important thing to know about, you know, at least, you know, in my, in my life, the way I see it, um, I know lots of, lots of other people would agree with me, but I don't want to speak for everyone, um, when somebody says, like, what's the most important thing you can tell me about trans people or trans issues? And I usually say something along the lines of, like, I have favorite bands. I have favorite TV shows. I have dogs. Mm -hmm. I like to give hugs. Potatoes are my favorite food. Like, like Potatoes, yay. I'm just, <laughs> right. <laughs> like, like, I'm just a person. You know, I, I obviously have a unique life experience that not a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of layers and lots of nuance to that. And I could spend years talking to you about dysphoria and hormones and, you know, medical care and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and, I mean, there's there's a lot to that. But, but you know, at the end of the day... I'm happy talking about bands. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, like, I just I just want to be accepted and affirmed as the person that I am. Yeah, and um, you know what goes on else. I mean, I'm happy to have that conversation because I've kind of made it my thing. Like, I want to be vocal about trans issues and LGBT issues and atheist issues. So, like, I'm setting myself up to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, I want to have those conversations. Well, um, you know, it's a dirty job. Somebody's got to do it, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and, and you know. It, it, you are a very confident and I would say charismatic person, and it's oh, well, thank you. I think that's the first time. I think that's the first time I've ever been called charismatic, and I'm gonna own that. Go for it, <laughs> you are. <laughs> but oh, you know you. what? And and I've been told I have a presence. Well, I, I hope so because I have two shows. I better have one. But uh, you do. You do. I'll, I'll. Thank you. <laughs> but the thing is. It, I like doing this, and I know that there are a lot of people who need a voice that don't feel like they could do something like this, that don't want to do something like this. And to me, it's like, you know what? If I can be there and be that voice and be that source of information, hey, that means that that, less, that more shy person doesn't have to do it. At least that's the way I look at it. Well, you know, it's that that old saying: "It takes all kinds." Like it's like cheesy corporate yeah. speak or whatever. But yep. um, you know, there are people needed everywhere. Like, use the talent that you have and do what you can with it. Um, you know, the, the thing that I always say is like, you know, as far as LGBT folks go, especially trans trans people and trans kids, and you know, there's the whole subset: trans people with disability, trans people of color. Yep. Um, who have you know have extra layers of disadvantage on top? Um, yeah. Lots of those folks spend their days literally trying to survive. Oh, they I don't. Can... They don't have the resources to go out and 
you know, give a speech at at a, at a conference. They don't have, uh, you know, they can't get a good job to have an internet connection and do a podcast and do a show. Um, yeah. You know, those, th- they're just trying to survive. And if the rest of the world is going to give a shit, someone like me, who's relatively privileged in that, in that way, um, you know, I'm not rich by any stretch of the imagination, but I've got a solid internet connection. I feel like I have at least somewhat of a gift for talking to people. So I just, I'm, I'm trying to use that to make a difference in the way that I can. Um, and, you know, maybe kind of open people's minds a little bit. So that's... Absolutely. Absolutely. And that goes to the whole atheism thing, too. Because we need more people talking about that, too. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. One question that I have that I think um, that I didn't have any clue of at all until um, Beth actually invited me to watch a uh, a show featuring uh, Zinnia Jones, who's a, a well known awesome. um, yeah she's a well known personality and and I mean I'm completely ignorant I didn't know who she was but I went and watched but that was the first time I ever heard the term cis person or cisgendered and if, could you explain that for me because I have, I've heard it but I think there are a lot of um, people out there that may not be aware of that because I like to think I'm relatively plugged in and I, I was clueless so I'd like to know more about that please okay so um, there's some controversy surrounding the word and mm-hmm. I'll explain that but okay. basically cisgender just means not trans okay so the the, the the strict definition of someone who is transgender, okay? Transgender is an umbrella term that yes. refers to anyone who identifies outside of their birth assigned sex. Okay. So I was born with a penis, they slapped an M on my birth certificate, male assigned at birth. Yes. Um, so the fact that I identify as something other than that mm. identifies me as a transgender person. It doesn't necessarily say what that identity is, it just says that my identity does not match what my identity was assumed to be when I was born. Yes. A cis person is someone who those things are congruent with one another. They slap an F on your birth certificate because you're born with a vagina and you identify as a woman. That's cisgender. Okay. And um, the prefix trans means across. The prefix cis means same as. Okay. Um, so... And the word is relatively new. I think it's like early 90s-ish. Okay. Um, and some people object to the word cisgender because what it comes down to is is privilege. A lot of people bristle at the word privilege, don't care. Um, yeah. Because it's a thing. If you don't, yeah. you're wrong. If, if you don't think it's a thing, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Many people think there are normal people and there are trans people, right? No. And you can see and you can see the problem with that dichotomy. <laughs> I'm sorry, but normal is just bullshit. <laughs> well, right, exactly. Um, so using the word cisgender and the word transgender, it normalizes being transgender, right? Okay. So one of the things that you you hear people talk about is othering, right? It, making an excuse to make you part of an out group, yes. and basically using the words cis and trans is a way to is a way to to circumvent that. So you're not othering trans people. It's just you know just like being homosexual is a normal variant of human sexuality. Mm-hmm. Being transgender is a normal variant of of human gender identity. Yeah. Um, so where the controversy comes in is, you know, people, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to accept a label that, you know, I don't want Mm -hmm. or, and, and basically what it comes down to is, is a loss of privilege, right? You're in a privileged position because you are a person who is generally considered by society to be normal and you have people who are below you on the rung of that ladder being elevated to being equal with you. And generally, when you dig down to it, that's why people don't like the word. 
Okay. I, I didn't know that there was a controversy either, but like I said... Oh, I good God, there is such a controversy. <laughs> I'd um, only, seriously, <laughs> only first heard the, the word like maybe a couple of months ago, if that. So I'm all new to that sphere. But So, yeah, you'll hear it... Um, so you, typically you hear it from two different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. um, you hear it from MRAs, men's rights activists. Oh, those, yes, okay. Um, and uh, and TERFs, trans-exclusionary radical feminists, who are, um, you know, basically you're not a woman if you're not born with a vagina, and you're also not a real woman if you don't spend your entire life trying to abolish gender completely. It's it's fucking ridiculous is what it is. Um, Two but, groups that I probably don't want to interact with then. Yay. Yeah, well, and see, like... <laughs> I identify very strongly as a feminist, right? Feminism is about mm -hmm. gender equality. It's not about yeah. fucking man-hating. It's not about it, any of that stupid shit. It's about actual gender equality. That's what it is. That, right. I'm with so, you, girl. <laughs> right. <laughs> so a lot of times you get into those arguments with people who are like, oh, you're a feminist. That just means that you hate men. No, it doesn't mean that I hate men. I love men. I um, really hate <laughs> <like> you. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so typically, those are the kinds of people that you that you hear that from, and 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 like I said, what it always comes back to is that someone in a privileged position who is seeing a loss of privilege as being oppression. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, I guess that's... I guess I'm weird, but I've always considered that if if I give up some quote privilege to somebody who needs it, then that's okay with me. <laughs> Well, and right. I, it's it's about losing something you never should have had in the first place. That's why they call yeah. it a privilege. <laughs> I know. I mean, like, I'm I'm as pasty white as they come. I I un unfortunately that that comes with a lot of that bullshit. And I'm like happy to disseminate it back to other folks. No problem. Well, right. <laughs> and that goes back to you know you're asking you you know you brought up how to be a good ally. Mm -hmm. You know the the best way to be an ally to anyone is to use whatever privilege you have, whatever that may be, to give people who aren't on that platform of privilege, to give them your platform to voice their point of view. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, generally speaking, you know, I'm a binary identified trans person. I, I identify solidly as female. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not like genderqueer or... Right. Um, you know, by gender or, or anything like that, um, and being by bi being binary identified gives me a certain level of privilege because nine times out of ten, when you say transgender person, what's the first thing you think of? You think of a white trans woman. Yeah. So nine times out of ten, that's what you're gonna yep. think of. Um, yep. But that's not that's not the whole of what being trans is. So one of the things that I've tried to do on my show, I have a segment on my show called Be a Better Ally. I know. And, I like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and um, starting with episode four, the, I think the next three or four Be a Better Ally segments are all going to be from people who are non-binary identified, trans people. Oh, cool. um, you know, people who identify as genderqueer, or you know somewhere else on the gender spectrum that doesn't equal male or female, um, and there's some interesting stuff about using pronouns other than he and she. Um, yeah. You know, there's good stuff around, you know, gay jokes, trans jokes, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of something that I'm trying to do to to recognize my own, like even within the trans community. I mean, the trans community. If there's if there is a community that I think everyone can agree on that gets shit on mercilessly, it is us. <laughs> um, um, yeah. would, but but even it. within that community, I have I have a slightly pr privileged position of my own because one, I'm binary identified, and two, I don't live in poverty. Yes. Um, you know, I have I have a decent job. I have the means to to take care of myself, and I have access to medical care, which you know the, those are things that people normally assume are a given. But a lot of times, even trans people who have insurance, who otherwise have access to medical care, don't have access to trans-specific medical care. And mm -hmm. that in itself is a privilege. I hit the fucking lottery with the doctors that I have. Um, and I've had to pay out of pocket for them until recently. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah so, you got yourself your new job. That's so exciting. Yes, I'm very excited about that. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, like I said, even if you know, if I hadn't met all of the amazing people that I have in my community, I mean, the therapist that I have, I met by chance, mm-hmm. um, and the endocrinologist that prescribes my hormones. The only reason I got to him was because of my therapist that I met by chance. Um, well, you know, I, and I, I, I can totally identify with that because, as you may know from my other show, I have issues with having been a, a, a survivor of incest, mm-hmm. and going to the doctor has been like a no-go for me for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And um, in Canada, we have something called a nurse practitioner that's basically... Mm-hmm. A doctor that they're they just can't prescribe uh, narcotics, but they yeah. can do anything yeah. else. We have those here and, too. Okay, well, I I the place that I go to, um, they had changed nurse practitioners a couple of times, and it was really unsettling for me because that's a, a huge deal for me to even show up in the first place. And I won the fucking lottery because the last time I went, the new nurse practitioner is a former psychiatric nurse who felt that there wasn't enough attention being played to mental health in the strict medical field. And she specializes and she specializes in abuse and post traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> like how <laughs> where were yeah. you? Like, okay, is there God? Maybe right. no. <laughs> Didn't, didn't go that far, but yeah. Yeah. So. Well, so, you know, I started because, so to access pretty much any trans-related medical care, you pretty much have to go through a therapist, which there's right. a controversy around that. That's a really long story, whether or not you should have to go through a gatekeeper to get, you know, hormones yeah. and all that stuff. There's a whole controversy with that. But yeah. I wanted to see a therapist anyways just because I figured I would need help coping. Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, there are a couple of resource sites that I found, and I made an appointment, and I met with a therapist for the first time, and she wasn't a bad person or anything like that. We just didn't click. Yeah. Um, she was you know, pushing, like, 70, um, and, I mean, working with trans people was a specialty of her, so it wasn't, I mean, I wasn't just seeing a therapist who had no, I mean, we just didn't click on a personal level. And way different, happened. yeah, way different generation. So it was like, you know, no hard feelings. It's just this is not a relationship that's going to work. So I was just kind of like, well, damn, you know, because that was there were a couple of others, um, and I came out to a friend of mine, and she told me like, oh my god, I work with a trans person. You should talk to him, trans guy that had transitioned fairly recently. Um, right. So she put me in touch with him. And he was telling me about some of the support groups in the area, and one of the support groups is facilitated by this therapist. that I And he was like, yeah, it's a great group. Come hang out. I went to the group. I met her. And, uh, and I was like, wow, I really like her. Oh, by the way, she's a therapist that specializes in dealing with trans people. Awesome. Nice. So I started seeing her, and the be- one of the best endocrino- endocrinologists in Cincinnati, which is a doctor that prescribes hormones, if you don't know, um, he is he's kind of close to retirement. He doesn't take new patients unless they're referred to him by therapists dealing with trans people because dealing with trans people is his thing. Oh, fantastic. So, so I mean, I just, it's like hitting the lottery twice. Yeah. Um, and so, so there was no awkwardness. I was going to these people specifically because, hey, I'm trans. I'm pursuing transition. I want to get hormones all this sort of stuff. And so I went into those offices with those expectations. There was no awkward coming out period. There was no like, oh, I've never dealt with a trans person before. I don't even know what the hell to say to you. Yeah. Um, you know, when I went to his office for this first time, I had had my name legally changed. The, the, the person behind the desk after I filled out the paperwork discreetly asked what my preferred name was. So they never yeah. called me by my male name. Um, yep. which is huge, especially, like, I'm in public, around a bunch of people who I don't know, I'm really uncomfortable, I'm really nervous, this whole thing's new to me, like, holy shit, like, that was huge. It makes and, such a difference to know that the person that you're dealing with already knows how to deal with what your issue is. Exactly, <laughs> and that is something that is so exceedingly rare for trans people to find. Um, yeah. It's getting better in our city, in Cincinnati, 
Um, and there are some cities where where it's not super hard to find in bigger cities, but there are lots of people, especially in rural areas, who desperately need these things and can't get them. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's so wonderful. I I, I can totally relate to that one because I'm like, oh, you understand? Oh my gosh! Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, before we wrap up, I still have uh, my logical fallacy uh, for this week, so I'm going to go ahead and play that, and then uh, we can uh, wrap things up a bit. Sweet. Uh, hang on. Well, my lovely, really slow computer does its thing. Da, 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 da. Where is it? Come here. Ah, there. And now, it's time for Logical Fallacies for Dummies. <laughs> On this week's Logical Fallacy for Dummies, I'm going to talk about the bandwagon fallacy. <laughs> What's the bandwagon fallacy? Well... In basic terms, it means everyone's hopping on the bandwagon. So the idea is that something is true or more likely to be true because more and more people are believing the same thing or are coming to the same conclusion. But the problem here is just because a lot of people are starting to glom on to a specific idea doesn't mean that it's true by any stretch. I mean, look at religion. There has been lots and lots of religions over the centuries, and as new religion comes in, more people will adhere to that religion who hear about it and think, hey, maybe this is the right one. But that doesn't mean anything as far as veracity of the claims go. That's where, you know, things like empirical data and concrete proof come in. So, for instance, let's take a listen to this clip and... We'll see, this is a little more subtle than out and out saying, hey, all these people are changing their minds, this must mean it's true. But it's kind of the implication. So let's listen. While Christian churches in the UK are struggling to draw people to worship, the Islamic community there is burgeoning. And as Aussie's Polly Boyka reports, some Muslim groups are doing all they can to counter fears the rapid growth is a challenge to British tradition. It's an infectious video that's gone viral in a matter of days. The only difference between it and Pharrell Williams' original is that the people dancing are British Muslims. Its creators say that they're promoting a message that UK Muslims are a diverse, cosmopolitan and above all, happy lot. And why shouldn't they be? Islam is the fastest growing religion in the UK. New analysis of census figures even suggests that it could become the country's dominant religion in as little as 10 years' time. The number of Muslims in the UK has doubled in the past decade, with Mohammed now the most popular name for baby boys in London. The average age for the British Muslim community is around 26. So the British Muslim population is uh, incredibly young, uh, and you have this energy, this vibrancy, this, this sizzling, crackling energy. Like is the truth. In many ways, the UK is a trailblazer. It's set to become the first non-Muslim country to launch a financial bond that can be bought by Islamic investors, while the Law Society recently issued guidelines for drafting Sharia wills, citing rising demand. Unlike the viral popularity of Islam, the new analysis of latest census figures by the Office for National Statistics shows that the Church of England is declining 50% faster than was previously thought. The country's aging Christian demographic means that its official religion has experienced a loss of more than 4 million worshippers since 2001. The decline of churches in the UK's long term it just happens to be now approaching really rock bottom. So 95% of people don't attend a church on an average Sunday. Christian worship in churches is already the concern of a tiny minority of people. The figures have even motivated the Prime Minister, David Cameron, to attempt to shore up the institution's foundations, calling on Christians to be more evangelical about their faith and advertising what he called the healing power of the church. 
So while the people here aren't actually saying, wow, all these people are converting to Islam, that must mean that Islam is the right religion, that's the sort of thing that I have heard Muslims claim. Look at all these people that are converting to Islam. Allah wants all his children to come home, and that means that Allah is the real God, and et cetera, et cetera. Except they're not the first ones to claim this. I mean, back in the day when the Roman pantheon was the in thing, the Christians that came along, they were the ones saying, hey, look at all these people that are becoming Christians. That must mean that Yahweh is the right God. Well, yeah, and there are billions of Catholics now, and they used to claim that they're the world's fastest growing religion, and that's what Islam is claiming now. And I've actually heard Mormons say that they're the world's fastest growing religion too, and they try to back that up with the fact that they send thousands of missionaries all over the world all the time trying to convert more people to Mormonism and getting baptized and all that fun stuff. But does it mean anything's true? Of course not. Just because millions of teenagers think that Justin Bieber is awesome doesn't mean he's supremely talented, does it? I don't know. I don't think he is, but hey, I'm not a teenage girl anymore. Far from it. But that's the point. Just because a lot of people might agree with an idea, that does not mean by any stretch that it has validity. You still want to go do your research. Look it up. Find out what real science says about something. Find out what the facts are. Don't just believe something because, hey, everyone else and their uncle is starting to go that way too. Because that's not going to guarantee that anything is actually accurate. So, for now, that is this week's Logical Fallacy for Dummies. God, that is my favorite <laughs> argument. Christianity has to be right. I mean, there are so many Christians, right? Uh, well, that's actually closer to argumentum ad populum, but it's very similar. Right, yeah. Very similar. But yeah, I know. Oh, well, look at all the people that are turning Muslim. That must mean it's right. No, no, no. <laughs> that's why, like, you know, well, yeah, millions of people think Justin Bieber is cool, too, but, you know... <laughs> Justin Bieber's so cool. Come on now. <laughs> speaking, you know, of, he, speaking of trans people, did you know Justin Bieber's trans? Have you seen that video? That's yes. He he apparently had his breasts removed and yep. and think the guy now. You know. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Manning. Good old he, Pastor Manning, the gift that keeps on giving. Because <laughs> then after Justin Bieber had his breasts removed, he went to Starbucks and drank some semen. You know. <laughs> semen and his lattes. I swear to God, the way that he says latte, that is the funniest thing in the world to me. I don't even care about what else he's saying. Lattes. Hey, have you God, seen where, like, where they're like, you know, you, you talk about semen an awful lot. Have you have you been tempted to be, like, gay? Well, of course, I was oh, in prison yeah. years. Yeah. I was tempted. <laughs> uh, right. It We're never gonna... ends. We're going to see Pastor Manning caught in a Ted Haggard anytime soon. Now. Oh, absolutely. Without a doubt. No question yeah. about it. <laughs> oh, shit. So before we go, is there anything else that you would like to add or, or mention or cover? Because, I mean, if we go over, we go over. I don't give a shit, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, honestly, I think we I mean, I think we hit the most important stuff. Good. Um, you know, just the the support system is the thing. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you don't want to jump all over somebody you don't know to be like, <laughs> oh, hey, I have those. <laughs> yes, she does. That's my, <laughs> my lovely husband flashing Hi, off husband. his Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... You know, don't don't jump all over a person you don't know just to. Okay, so actually, let me let me put it this way: be an ally because you want to be an ally, not because you want to feel good about being an ally. Yes. If that, that makes, makes sense. sense. And, and yes, no, he's brought um, goofy. Because <laughs> he's goofy like that. <laughs> don't have one of those yet. Working on it. Awesome. Um, <laughs> I got five. <laughs> Actually, technically, I'm six. Uh, <laughs> um, 
so um, one thing that happens a lot is, um, and this this is gonna sound this is gonna sound angry, and it's kind of angry, and it's mm-hmm. gonna sound ungrateful, and it might be a little ungrateful, but not really. Um, so something that I see a lot that the, the, talking about allies is if you hear a story about a trans person, if you know if you read what it's about, oftentimes what the story is actually about is someone else's journey to accept them, mm-hmm. not actually that person's journey. And it's about kind of a, a self-congratulation because, oh, look at me. I've proven how good of a person I am. And right. oftentimes the stories that you hear about trans people are that way. If you hear a story mm-hmm. about trans kids, it's not about the kids you know, figuring themselves out. It's about, oh, look at how awesome these parents are. And they are, trust me. Supportive parents are awesome. Yeah. Um, but the, the best thing that I can say, if, if you want to be a good ally, I mean, to anyone really, but to trans people especially, let, let our stories be about us. And let, let us speak for ourselves whenever possible. Um, and we didn't even talk about the the Lila Alcorn thing. Obviously, yeah. that's, um, that's big. but one of the things that I was the most impressed by in Cincinnati, there are some big LGBT organizations represented here, national organizations um, who have steering committees. They're all volunteers, and traditionally, when you think of these organizations, you don't. The, you know, transgender equality is not necessarily the first thing you think of when you think of these organizations, even though it's technically part of what they do. Um, but these guys are the ones that have the media contacts for the LGBT community. And when we said, like, we need to get people talking on the news, these people said, we need trans people on the news. Give yeah. me phone numbers and I'll make it happen. These people weren't trying to speak on our behalf they were using their platform to give us a voice. And that's, they were saying, we need trans faces out there. I can make the connection, and I can make it happen, but you're the one whose face has to be out there. And I think that is probably the most valuable thing to come from all of that, is it's not about me. It's not about me bragging about how good of an ally I am. It's not about me feeling self-satisfied for being an ally. It's about me actually making a difference and me using whatever influence and whatever privilege I have to elevate someone else and give someone else the chance for a voice. So yeah. one thing that I would say is be always be cognizant of that. That's very, very, very important. Um, because I've heard... And I, I think mean, I've heard, so... Yeah, go ahead. I've, I, I've heard... You know, conversations between people who have obviously never even met a trans person talking about the Leela Alcorn thing. And and I'm thinking to myself, like, did you even try and seek out a trans person to have this conversation? Um, because there are few, there are very few um, of us who don't know what it's like, at least on some level, to go through what she went through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and it's so easy, I think, um, for people who want to be allies to lose that connection and not even realize that they're making it about them. Mm-hmm. I think it's a really, really easy thing to fall into, and I'm really glad you brought that up because it's it, you get into the whole, I want to be there, I want to be supportive, and yada, 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 and we don't realize that, wow, we're not really talking about the person who has the, the need anymore. We're talking about, your, like you said, we're talking about like how cool are we because we like, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's an important thing to be cognizant of, absolutely, because it's it's just an easy thing to lose in the shuffle, I guess. So thank you for that because it, it's... It needs, and I like that with what you said about the press, because they could easily be out there, oh, we're going to talk about, you know, issues facing trans people. Well, you're not a trans person. And so to have the trans people say this is what we're facing makes it so much more real and so much more um, 
it's easier to kind of process that when it's a real person saying it, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like uh, when I see people, I, I've, and I, I don't necessarily mean to um, rag on Muslims, but that's just what I've encountered is, is Muslim people who are like, well, you know, if I've been told that if, if I was molested as a child that I must have done something to cause that and I've you know I usually when I put out there hey I've had this happen to me myself that usually is like oh that's a real person wow okay now I need to like double think about what I was gonna say mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's you know when, when you're talking about any issue really you want to mm -hmm. seek out the people who have the personal stake in the issue because yeah. um, if you want to have a conversation about rape and sex abuse you go to someone who has Someone obviously who's willing to talk about it, but someone yes. who has that experience and and who can and who can speak with authority on the issue, um, mm -hmm. because you don't want to have just an echo chamber of people who have no idea what they're talking about talking about yeah. it. Because um, especially if they're people who are in positions of power, like in the press, for example, yes. um, you know. And 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 I will say, um, you know, there were some missteps during the mm -hmm. Leela Alcorn situation. But I would say, for the most part, the media in Cincinnati got it right. Um, Good. You know, there there were people who were genuinely interested in hearing our stories, and they told our stories. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I was on the news twice, and they asked great questions, and Good. they seemed really interested in 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 what it was really all about. Like, they didn't really seem interested in the soundbite, in the Good. You know, the the quick, like controversial headline. I mean, I'm sure there was some of that. I know. I mean, I didn't see literally everything that ever happened, um, but you know, there were some some amazing people who are really skilled in dealing with the press here. Um, and again, trans allies, not trans people, who yeah. who took charge of it and they used their press contacts. And they said it's super important for you to get this right. Here's how you get it right, and here's who you talk to. Excellent. Um, and it was just, I mean, it was an amazing thing to see. Like, you see groups who depend on outside funding saying, no, we don't need funding. Like, there's a local trans organization here called Heartland Trans Wellness. They serve, like, eight or nine states. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other groups that were like, don't ask anyone to donate to us. Heartland Trans Wellness needs this money. Like, yeah. just so many people just putting aside their self-interest and saying, here's where the need is. Let's make this about what it should be about. And, and put the help where it really needs to be. Um, and and obviously the, other it good, was... the, the other good thing about having uh, trans people do the speaking is you're going to get not just one person's take on it, but you're going to get that cornucopia because every trans person has a different um, uh, experience. And so oh, yeah. having... You know, not just like, well, this is the one true trans person who's going to speak for all of you. <laughs> right. So right. you get that mixture of people that can speak to, well, this is my experience, and this is my experience, and this is my experience. And and that even makes it more real because people are going to be like, oh, well, they're all different, like just all of us are all different. What do you know? <laughs> right. I mean, you know, you're talking to me as a trans woman. You could have the same conversation with a trans man and get all new information. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Exactly, you know, because like, they're, they're not going to talk to me about, um, you know, hey, I have boobs. It's going to be, whoa. I have right. Things. Well, <laughs> and, right, and obviously that's, you know, the I mean, the body changes are a thing. But, I mean, just navigating society. Like, so mm -hmm. one of the things that I always laugh when people talk about male privilege, I'm like, yes. bitch, listen, you're talking to somebody who used to have it and had to give it up. Yes, um, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So... That's so, so that's obviously a pretty jarring experience, right? Yeah. Then, See, then something else I never would have thought of. Right. So, so then you look at a trans man, if if they fit enough of the quote unquote stereotypical male role, um, they actually step into male privilege. Mm-hmm. And because they know what it's like not to have it, I have trans guy friends who have told me how incredibly uncomfortable it makes them to have that privilege. Wow. Huh. 
And, and and then of course they also I mean they deal with the same things as like you know I'm not a real woman they're not a real man mm-hmm. so you know there are similarities there um, but I mean that's an entirely different dynamic um, you know gaining a privilege that you didn't used to have versus losing one yes you know, I mean th- those are two just completely and totally separate experiences to have. And I mean, I could talk to you for hours about losing male privilege, and yeah. you know, trans men who have it can go for hours about the same thing, or trans men who don't have it, who don't look quote unquote manly enough, who don't fit the stereotype enough, yep. can talk about how you know I, I have friends who talk about feeling like they're kind of stuck in between worlds, right? Mm-hmm. Because they're they're not. They are not women. Yep. They are men, but society doesn't accept them as men. As men. So that yeah. puts, you know, and, and obviously trans women who don't fit in the female stereotype have sort of the, the same kind of issue. So, um, so yeah, I mean, just navigating society is just, yeah. That's, yeah. Wow. We could, we could go for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? We can have a, we can discuss more in depth another time too, because I think it's just so important to, to keep talking about it and keep the lines of communication open and learn from each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, if I can plug the show. Yes, please plug your show. Um, the Gatheist Manifesto. We are a show about the intersection of atheist and LGBT issues. Um, sometimes we may stray a little further into LGBT. Sometimes we may stray a little further into atheist. Um, but you know, the idea is um, outreach on behalf of the LGBT community to the atheist community, and outreach to the LGBT community on behalf of the atheist community. Because I feel like there's sort of a disconnect there. Um, there are some non-religious LGBT people who don't realize that the atheist secular community is generally so open. Um, and you know, lots of folks in the atheist community who are very open-minded and willing to learn but have never met uh, a trans person that they know of or you know, don't really know gay people who just want to learn. Um, yep. And you know, if we can attract the occasional theist to you know, figure out what we're about, like I'm totally into that too. That's why the show is PG-13. Um, but you know the idea is just education and outreach, and just kind of helping us all understand each other a little better, and learning how to support each other a little better. There's humor. We have a segment called Fun with Conservapedia, where we just make say, fun of the uh, stupid shit that's on oh Conservapedia. <laughs> <laughs> I never read that shit, and I'm like, they fucking have this up somewhere. Wow. Oh, it's amazing. Talk <laughs> about diving down a rabbit hole. I know, God. but it's like. <laughs> Atheism and obesity? Are you shitting oh, yeah. me? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yep. yep. I'm like, and there's yeah. the, the picture of Stephen Fry with the birthday cake, yeah. which is just perfect because he's atheist, gay, and... Uh, I that, but okay. Well, right. Yeah. Uh, but you know, if you're five pounds over and you're an atheist, oh, you're obese. Ah. Right. Well, it's you know, like it's it's an exercise in the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, um, they probably are demons too, or something. You know, you right. look at human possession. Oh, there's Stephen Fry again. Oh. Right. <laughs> so, um, so the show's on Secular Media Network. Um, still waiting on iTunes to get its shit together. Um, mm-hmm. Right now, you can find us on Spreaker. If you just just type Secular Media Network, it comes up easy, more easily. If you just type Secular Media Network, um, you'll okay. see the Gatheist Manifesto. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, the first and third Tuesday of each month. A new episode comes out. We have okay. two out, and uh, yeah, so that's so that's the show. Hopefully, it's hopefully it's fun and interesting. It is. I can definitely <laughs> say it is. So go listen, people. Like, well, in five minutes, anyway. <laughs> right, yeah, don't leave yet. Yes, yes, l- l- finish us up first, but yes, definitely go listen, because I-, I loved it, I thought it was awesome, and uh, you- you've got some good interviews and stuff on there, so it's-, it's definitely worth a listen. And like I said, your How to Be a Good Ally segment is fantastic, 
because it's you know what is important and and people like myself there are things that I never would have even considered it's like well shit okay that's something else I need to be aware of <laughs> right you know? well it's you know I I'm not uh, I'm not a talented enough broadcaster to pull off a four to five hour show um, <laughs> but I want to make sure I get as many perspectives in as possible so you know as opposed to just going out and doing interviews with all of these people and waiting four or five years to get to everyone I want to I figured that would be kind of a, a great way to just throw in some short um, you know especially about parts of the queer and trans spectrum that don't necessarily you don't necessarily hear a lot about um, you know, people who are people who are bisexual have their own subset of issues that they deal with people who mm -hmm. are pansexual um, you know, people who are non-binary identified trans people, there are all kinds of layers and I want to make sure that, I want to make sure that everyone's heard. Um, I don't want to just get on there and talk about gay people and trans women. <laughs> so. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's great to get as many voices out there as possible. Absolutely. Awesome. And uh, for anybody out there, too, uh, Beth sent her regrets. She just wasn't feeling very well tonight. But Havoc and Chaos is her blog, and you can find her on Facebook. And if you look for Havoc and Chaos, I'm sure you can find her as well. She's always posting about lots and lots of crazy people. And unfortunately, a lot of them are in government, which is really scary. So look her up. By all means, please. And also, um, my other show, My Secular Savior, we just had uh, episode five come out, uh, mysecularsavior.com. And on my Twitters or on my lovely little uh, lower third there, you can find me on all those places. So uh, look us up. And um, yeah. So, Callie, thank you so much for joining us. It was a wonderful Thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun. Yay. And we'll definitely have to have you back because this is not just like a two-hour conversation. This is an ongoing dialogue that I think everybody should have. Oh, yeah, and I'm at Gaytheist Callie on Twitter. Oh, yes, because I followed you. Yay. Yes. Yay. All right, folks, so join us next week. And next week, it's Canadian Mania again. The Canucks are taking over. And I really am happy to say that our guest next week is going to be Ali Rizvi. He's going to join us from Tirana. And we're going to talk about uh, Islam and uh, Muslim issues and all of that fun stuff. So come on over and uh, hang out with us and Ali next week. And until then, we will see you next Wednesday. And I will leave you, as always, with the humanist creed from our dear friend, Dave Foda. My computer. There we go. I know the truth and power of reason and of rational thinking, and I will use them to my advantage. I know the truth and power of educating myself and of expanding my intellectual boundaries and I will educate myself. I know the truth and power of vanquishing ignorance and I will do so whenever the opportunity presents itself. I know the truth and power of morality without supervision and of true and accurate righteousness. I know the truth and power of obliterating tyranny be it intellectual, emotional, or philosophical, and will work toward that goal whenever and however possible. I know the truth and power of human ingenuity. I know the truth and power of human compassion, and I will be mindful of the welfare of others. I know the truth and power of equality and fairness for all living things. I know the truth and power of the importance of our families, our friends, and our fellow men and women. I know the truth and power of human stewardship of our lands, our waters, and our skies, and I will try to act to preserve our environment. I know the truth and power of the sciences of mathematics, of physics, and of chemistry, and of the important role of these disciplines in understanding the workings of this cosmos. I know the truth and power of the rejection of all notions or beliefs that reside in the supernatural or the superstitious, and of those notions or beliefs that we are not supposed to be able to explain. 
and I know that these rejections are necessary for humankind's survival. I am a human being with a free mind, liberated from irrational influence and from unreasonable dogma.